All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for coming tonight to this meeting. Uh, and at this time, I will call tonight's meeting uh, to order uh, of the of this uh, meeting of the boards. And thank you very much for this first time, you know, first time doing this. I think this is long overdue to have this time to everybody get together and get on the same page and just talk about things and see where we are and uh, and see how things are going. Um, I don't believe Lindsay has a um, roll call to go through, so I will I will skip that part. You do have a roll. Oh, and you do want to do the roll? All right. So, okay, Lindsay's excited to do the roll. So, before we do the roll, though, let's begin with the pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And thank you very much, everybody. All right, Lindsay, have at it. Right. Council Member John Casey. Present. Council Member Terrence Fennelly. Present. Council Member Adelaide Rudolph. Present. Council Member David Sauter. Present. Supervisor Jared Simpson. Present. Thank you. I can also confirm that the meeting was properly advertised. Thank you very much. Um, Chuck, do you have your whole do you I have do, those yeah. planning board here? Yeah, I had the I was smart enough to have a meeting ahead of time. I got them all here. I, I wouldn't let them go. A meeting before and dinner yeah. is an amazing thing. Okay, <laughs> excellent. And then for the zoning board. Not so much. <laughs> okay. So, so, but you're the you're few, but you're strong. Correct. Absolutely. These are three strongest. You're the three are the three strongest members, the three <laughs> most dedicated members of the of the ZBA. But thank you for being here tonight. Um, I invite all of you have you had the surveys that were sent out and some of the information to prepare for the meeting that was sent out. Uh, I invited Matt Horn to come in and kind of facilitate this. So we all would have a chance to go through all of this together and hopefully at the end come out uh, on the same page and have some open discussion on where we think we're going as a town, make sure our each board that our goals are kind of aligned to see if we see any gaps or any mistakes along the way uh, or any things that we can that we can fix to have that communication because we don't often have this time, like I've said, to sit down as you know, across boards and have these full communications. Uh, so at this time, I will turn the time over to Matt Horn from MRB Group. Um, so the floor is yours, Matt, Great. to lead us away. All right. Thank you all so much. I appreciate it. I wouldn't have us go around the table. I think that would soak the whole night. We've got so many good people here. Um, I do appreciate everybody you know, investing your evening. Um, it's, a, it's a, I think, a really critical uh, effort. Um, so just background for me, I'm, uh, my name is Matt Horn. I'm the director of local government services for MRB group. Uh, we support the town of Canandaigua in lots of different ways, um, on the community development side. Uh, we, we have a longstanding relationship in engineering and architecture with the community. Um, we've got, uh, I think a good track record. You might know some of my colleagues, like Greg Hotailing or Lance Brabant, who have supported the planning and zoning boards. Uh, and your your planning uh, community development staff uh, for uh, for a long time. My my role at MRB Group is on the local government operations side, and uh, so my background is I spent about ten years as the city manager of Geneva, um, and another ten years before that working in small cities uh, around the country on community development, economic development, planning. Uh, opportunities or roles and responsibilities. I'm a huge local government nerd. I go on vacation and watch city council meetings on the public access uh, TV. Uh, um, most of my vacation photos are of streetscape elements, like great looking <laughs> curb lines and street lights. I have some of my kids in there near the street light that looked really cool, but it was usually <laughs> incidental. Um, I, I have a thing that I talk about when we talk about planning or, or something that, that I kind of live by. I say, great places don't happen by accident, right? So if you think about the coolest place you ever went on vacation or the nicest place you ever visited, 
or the greatest place you've ever lived, which is quite possibly and probably the town of Canandaigua, the things you love about that place were intentional. They were designed, right? And they were curated and cultivated by people like you. And in some cases, by you. A lot of the really cool things that I love about Canandaigua were curated by you and cultivated by you. Um, and so if we take that premise that great places don't happen by accident, then we have to have a plan, right? And we have to have people to manage um, and advance the principles of that plan. And that's all of the people in this room. Um, you know, I know we've got folks who've been around. I appreciate everybody who took the time and, and the effort to uh, complete the survey. You know, the, the general kind of big picture things I wanted to get out of that was, what's the 10-year what's the split here, right? Do we, we've got some folks who are brand new in their roles in the last year or two. And we've got some folks who've been around 10 plus years supporting Canandaigua from a community development perspective. And I, uh, Supervisor Simpson hit the nail on the head. What happens is um, you pass a comprehensive plan, which you've done, 2021, a gorgeous plan, well thought out, well designed. And then the world happens, right? And things start to happen. Um, you, I used to have a code enforcement officer that said, the day you pass a zoning ordinance, it starts to stale. Right? It's just like a house. You build a house, it starts to creak. Um, a new use comes along. A new traffic pattern evolves. A new, uh, a new way people do business. Evolves. And there's never been a, a greater time of change than we're experiencing in the last 10 years, the last five years. Right? Everything you knew about community development five, 10 years ago, what's it worth today? Right? Um, so... It's important that we check in regularly. The other thing that happens when the world happens is elections happen. Retirements happen. Turnover happens. And we, we bring new folks into the fold. And the more new folks we bring into the fold, the more different perspectives get, the more things start to pull apart at the seams. Not in a negative way necessarily, but the town board that appointed you, if you were sitting here 10 years ago at your first planning board meeting, the town board that appointed you probably looks very different than the town board that's sitting here today, right? And the comprehensive plan can be and is a fantastic guide, right? It should be our North Star, um, but it has to be colored in by policymakers and by policy executors like a lot of people in this table. So what I do with comprehensive plans is I turn to the vision page first. Because the vision page, this vision statement is something that should hold. When we talk about comprehensive planning, we think about comprehensive plans as 20-year plans. And we ask that they be updated every 10 years, right? Just to make sure we're, we're staying checked in with our community as our community evolves. Um, a 20-year plan, a 20-year to-do list for me is the biggest waste of time there is, right? If we make a list of what we're going to do, Jim, in year 19, I want to make sure that you go out and pave such and such a road, because we anticipate that in year 19, it's going to look kind of beat up. Forget about what happens between now and year 19. Just stick to the checklist. That's a good way to get unelected pretty quickly, right, over time. It's a good way for, uh, for us to see transitions, because things move. The world happens. But this is your North Star, right? This should not move very far over time. So I won't read the whole thing to you, but there are a lot of great words here that I think are apropos to tonight's discussion. The town of Kennedy maintain its character and beauty, the protection and enhancement of the natural, agricultural, rural, historic, and recreational resources. Balanced growth, economic development, protect Canandaigua Lake, quality of life. Those were the words that jumped off the page to me, right? And I, I sing your praises. You don't know this, but I have to speak at a lot of different mm -hmm. events, and I sing the town of Canandaigua's praises as a very well-planned community, right? You've identified your assets, and you're working to protect them. And the people around this table are have that responsibility to protect the assets you've identified, to protect your rural character. Not just rural, but agricultural, productive agriculture. Um, protect candidate. Those are big orders, right? 
And then off to the other side, we said balanced growth, economic development, quality of life, and deeper in the plan, housing for everyone, diversity of housing, equity, those kinds of things. So you can see that right out of the gate, there's a struggle. And that's why we don't just pass a plan and move on. Pass the plan and put you all to work on it as uh, the facilitators of that vision. So I ask you all, uh, as part of that survey that we sent around, to A, just give me an understanding. And there's no right or wrong or good or bad answer. Everybody here, most people here are volunteers or are not paid super handsomely for the civic duty that you're engaged in. Um, so time gets away from you. But I want to get kind of a feel for, hey, do, do you understand the comprehensive plan? You read it, you get it, you're, you're, you're good with executing on it. B, how we do it. How is the town doing with respect to um, growth and development in alignment with that plan? And then down to nuts and bolts things like, are developers getting a break? Or are developers getting a hard time? We're somewhere in the middle. Um, are we gracious to developers in a way that runs against the grain of the comprehensive plan or that runs against the grain of our quality of life? Um, or are we so steadfast that we're never going to get that economic development that we're talking about, that balanced growth that we were talking about? And we got some good answers and we, we saw some themes. And, um, and so that's what we want to get at here tonight or just kind of, kind of hit on those themes. So as the supervisor said, the goal for us at the end of tonight is that the planning and zoning and EC, is, are there ECB members here as well? Awesome. The planning and zoning and ECB members have a clear understanding of the town board's policy take, right? Remembering all of our roles here, I don't, we don't need to teach a class on it, but the town board sets the policy. This is the written policy, the adopted policy. There's a bunch of things that hang on this um, down, down the road. So the town sets the town board sets the policy and they ask you all to act on that policy, right? And so if you're a planning board member, you really are charged with shaping growth and development in accordance with this policy. If you're a zoning board member, you're charged with filling in the gaps when there's a when there's a pull apart, right? Uh, between what the vision of the comp plan says, what the law says, and what the practical reality is on the ground. Heavily governed by the way. Not, it's not a free pass to do what you will or to exercise your own discretion. It's a, a, you know, a multi-point test, right? To say these folks did or did not meet this multi-point test. So the zoning board is the release, the release valve, right? For when things get aired. And the ECB and others like you are meant to kind of to weigh in um, when you see development that could be supportive or might run against the grain of, uh, of the vision. So um, with that, I'm going to stop talking and start asking questions. And I would open by saying uh, what I'll ask zoning board members, what are the what are the top things you're seeing requests for variances on? You see a pattern? Sarah, I'll count on you too to weigh in because I know you <laughs> manage that that um, <laughs> zoning board agenda. On lot coverage. Lot coverage. Lot coverage. So people want to push the boundaries on what the existing code is. In specific districts, but yep. In further into the blood, bigger homes, more ancillary uses, sheds, everything. Yep. Everything. Especially how much uh, permeable area they need. Yeah, yeah permeable area. This is a good point in relation to the blood area that we have known flood areas that we have, mm -hmm. we seem to be increasing our heart shaped areas where we should be decreasing right. our expansion in those areas, more permeable areas, more um, and less expansion and growth in those for hard shape. Yeah. <clears throat> but just so you know, I'm the only one who has to read this at the end. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <it's> really <laughs> Nobody here has to read it. It's like, I, is that is that English? <laughs> it cannot be hired to transcribe anything for you. You've got something to do there. 
you're, what else? you're continuing to see a transition of people to full-time year-round homes, larger homes. They're selling homes towards the city and, and want the same amenities in the same space that they had. Mm -hmm. And they just don't fit in the pre-existing non-conforming. Other recurring zoning board issues. Setbacks. Setbacks. For things like generators and. You know, home generators are big. It's been a number of stream setbacks too. Stream? <laughs> Talked about so, somebody. Go ahead. We have one. I think your question is kind of um, painted a little bit mm. because there are issues that the community has asked of us a lot that are no longer asked because they know the answer is no. Ah, that's good. Well, that's good to hear, but it's an interesting point. So supervisor and I were having a conversation right before the meeting started and you know, what we were getting at was variances happen for a variety of reasons. If you're seeing patterns in variance, then it it means that there's development pressure. And I'm telling you guys like you don't know it, but there, it means that there's development pressure that runs afoul of the existing zoning. And a foul is probably a bad word anyway, that runs that runs against the grain of the existing zoning law. And what we encourage folks to do is, if you're getting this question, first of all, I mean, in a town the size of Canandaigua with the market pressure or the market activity in Canandaigua, it's not unheard of that the zoning board would be meeting every month. It's unheard of that the zoning board would grant more than 50% of the variance requests that come for them every month, if that's happening. I don't know, what, I don't know what's happening. Um, every month continuously for years, I'll say it that way, right? If that if that were the case, then we would say, all right, you know, this permeable area keeps coming up. This perme permeable area question keeps coming up. Do we wanna kick this over to the planning board and the town board to say, hey guys, should there be a change? Should we be making a change? And if the answer from the town board and the planning board is absolutely not, we're not going to increase permeable area in this district because it's intended to create a buffer for the lake and it's intended to create retention opportunities. Then you've got your clear direction, right? People will stop coming to ask because they'll see the pattern move away um, versus the town board saying, you know what? That makes a ton of sense. It makes sense. That let's let's add some, some permeable area to this. Let's change the zoning and move on. The, the goal is to put the zoning board in a much more comfortable place, right? Where they're not having to meet every single month for hours and hours and hours, right? But that's temporal too. How so? Uh, 2014 or so, zoning was revamped to adjust all of this. No, no variances were allowed for a period of time. And were granted, you mean? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I just yeah. want to make sure nobody, the board didn't say don't grant any variances. <laughs> variances were heavily restricted. Uh, for a period of time, and and now it does feel on the planning side, at least, it feels like we see a lot of variances come through mm -hmm. that goes contrary to planning. So it's temporal. I mean, that could be a people change, that could be, lack of a better term, a market change. Yeah, but it's it, in many cases once new zoning goes into effect, then everybody hardlines. It, it, the impression is that everybody hardlines to it for a period of time until they don't. And then we reopen the floodgates again to all pun intended to mm -hmm. allow for uh, variances. Again. Yeah, that's a great tip. You know, the newer the ordinance, the less likely that we require the variance, right? Chris, any thoughts on what you're seeing come across your desk that aren't already up here? Uh, it's well, the first one that I'm surprised didn't nobody raise the garage size. Um, and 
your development staff and your zoning board spotted the problem and recommended a solution. No, we don't need to put it on. Don't you put it on? Right. Problems in the middle being taken care of. Good. Um, and it worked, the system worked exactly the way it was supposed to. That's really good. Uh, lot coverage comes up. Um, setbacks for generators, which those aren't getting granted. Have we? Have we granted any? Um, I think that's a product of the guys who are selling generators don't know, like, for example, Rocco will say, yeah, we're not going to apply for that variance. You're never going to get it. Let's not waste time. The generator salesmen are saying, oh, let's go get the variance. Um, but lot coverage, I think, um, I think what you just said is, is absolutely right. When the town switched to a percentage base lot coverage, just, and this is just the Nero D with um, lot coverage. Um, it's the only place we have a lot of coverage mm -hmm. restriction. Um, it has loosened up um, being able to get a variant, um, but we, you know, we have experienced zoning board members who are not giving them away. They're, you know, doing it based on those that five prong tests, and um, I'd say that's the only sort of routine variance that gets requested right uh, that's uh, that's the same request usually um, planning board members anything that that's not up here that you're seeing that was that you're referring out a lot or bumping out a lot i just want to clarify a lot of coverage and flood areas <clears throat> recently we had a variance come to us in a flooded area of Sandy Beach that they approved the variance for luck of pilot non-permeable area. Um, it was a, now in our job to figure out how to solve the water problem in that area. Um, and we went round and round about it. And my thought was, why are we approving a variance in this area that's known flooded? For us, then now we have to go on and do uh, make them do other things. So if we just cut back on that, it would make it much easier to do uh, our budget. Yeah. And then, therefore, it'll improve the lake because all that water is not going to go directly. But it'll get it. Yeah. Town board members, you're hearing any buzz? of things that should be up here on the wall? Oh, size. <clears throat> minimum. Minimum house size. Minimum house size. Ah. But not the, the opposite of larger home. Yeah. Right. <laughs> that comes a lot of What do you say, Terry? Both the tree. Yes. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Which we had talked about. We talked about in the ordinance committee. We haven't discussed the you know, the size or minimum size of what we You know, it's a uh, given cost, the affordability, issues of yeah. affordability, everything that goes along with that. It makes sense to, uh, you know, open that up and take a good look at it. That, um, smaller homes, maybe not tiny homes, but something, you know, smaller. Mm -hmm. Probably makes sense in some areas, if not across the board. So I think that's something we'll probably be looking at and take a very serious look at. It. Yeah. It makes it hard. It makes it hard with that because I a lot of those they don't get through the planning process to go to the planning board because they don't meet those requirements. So we don't know what kind of request there is out there. That's the challenge with that one. You know, it's not like we're, we're you know, because the plan, you know, they go to the planning department and it's like, well, you can't even build that. So don't even bother. So then we don't even get to that point other than. Don't tell them don't. Well, <laughs> you know, Sarah would never tell them don't bother. Um, not, no. Don't not even try. Or I was, oh, I was just using a planning board in general. But. Now that's um, definitely. <laughs> but so, but with that, 
maybe you know a mechanism for more of that feedback. We received, we did receive feedback, um, and I think that's anecdotal. Could be anecdotal from what <clears throat> our planning department's hearing. So then we're able to push that up the line to start taking action on that. You know, if it's if you hear it enough and you tell people I'm sorry enough, and then it gets to us, then we can look at it and say, okay, then we do need to look at we do need to address this issue. Uh, we did that with short-term rentals, which was another issue, um, which is always going to be looked at, probably looked at and tweaked and massaged, but that's another issue that that came forward because of things that we were hearing and, and feedback that we were getting. I think the uh, affordability issue really came <clears throat> to the forefront when we set up the, uh, what was the committee called? I mean, it was affordable housing. Yeah, affordable affordable yeah. I had to, you know, okay. answer my own question. <laughs> but that you know, really drove it home. And, you know, given the cost and the increases we've seen across the board and everything, um, and that affordability issue being what it is, you know, it is something that uh, really has to have a serious look at. And I was reading over the weekend the uh, ENC, the real estate section of the paper, had a thing about smaller homes. And a lot of communities have done that, you know, they've gone, and, they, and, and it said something, I didn't realize this until Saturday when I was reading the paper, that places like uh, Home Depot, Lowe's, Amazon, yeah, they yeah. sell yeah. smaller homes, you know, anywhere from 400 to 1,000 square feet. Yeah. And the prices are 20 grand, maybe 100 grand, something like that now. Quality and all that, and whether they meet New York State Building Code, I have no idea. But you know that that it is something that when you get into that affordability issue, and as you know from our LDC, you know we've discussed uh, these issues there too. That uh, the county's taken on a, a role looking at uh, at, at housing in, in, in general across the spectrum, and uh, you know part of our our vision here making this a you know an inviting town and a, a place where everyone has a, a, sh a shot at having a, a decent life um affordability is a big issue so now i mean it's gotta it, it's gotta be uh, you know elevated it's gotta be resolved the question i was it just occurred to me did anybody ever came up come in and ask for a variance on the minimum side the house has ever been a Challenge no. to that. The current minimum yeah. size is 1100, by the way, in case you're Yeah. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's a long, it's a long, long story. I don't know. It's so, <laughs> so, but then to my point is it hasn't gotten that far. Well, to, for, to push it, you know, the variance it, coming yeah. out saying, well, hey, this. It's just not yeah. fair. Right? Because typically what can happen, if it doesn't, wouldn't need to make its way through the planning, but actually couldn't make its way through right. the planning process well, but, because. But Sarah's telling them they can't Sarah could say no, and they could appeal it directly to the zoning. Well, that's what it's right. So right. that's the question: Is anybody doing my, that? My guess is the call that comes in is to not to Sarah, but the, the department as a whole, and says, "Hey, what's your minimum lot size in the mm -hmm. town of Canandaigua?" Mm -hmm. And the question gets answered, and, and the person long. goes moves mm -hmm. on. Yeah, yeah, house that. yeah, house size, not lot size. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah house but house, house yeah. Yeah. I think some people get, you know, they just feel like, oh, you know, that's a that's a that's a big one. It's just a hard eleven hundred square feet. That's it. I think they they seem to react differently than when it's a setback question. Yeah. Oh, I want to be two feet closer than I'm allowed. That doesn't seem like a big deterrent to people. But when you know they're asking about minimum house size, and I say eleven hundred square feet, and they're like, oh, they, you know, and I. I tell them their options when you propose a larger house, you could ask the zoning board for a variance to allow you to build a smaller one, you know, we, and um, most of the time they, I mean, I haven't, I think, like Chris said, yeah. I haven't seen them pursue it. They either choose to build a bigger house yeah. than they wanted to, or they go, I don't know. What they How do. often does the question come up with Sarah? I mean, Next year, I think there's one recent times. Yeah, yeah. two recent ones. It's not all the time, but I don't know. It's just one of those where it's like too wide. Yeah, interesting. I, I think that's a <laughs> that's a, a nationwide trend. To your point, another oh, one that comes up occasionally is um, 
changing the zoning from industrial to residential or from something into an MUL, et cetera, and so forth. So that comes up. Coming back to the size, the minimum size, we have two planned development proposals in front of us right now. All of those buildings would be two. I think each would be two hundred thousand. But two thousand. Well, they would all be small. Right. All of the yeah. properties would be small, and they're all high, higher than the. Right. So I don't think we're looking developers because of that request. I think it might be a single use of somebody that. So you're saying in the PUD request, they're under the 1100 square foot threshold? Yeah. No. 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 Mm -hmm. I think he's saying that that's not the market. But right. I'm saying there's not, it's, just, it's not developers that are coming to us and asking us to, I not trying to get hired to be lot side. No, it's typically individual people who want to put a house on a vacant lot. Got it. One of, the things, one of the things that I think the zoning board has faced, there, there seems to be this, people are trying to come up with a secondary use. I mean, you've got Sandy Beach, you've got a number of places where they, they would like to have an office. They would like to have, I mean, they're, they're, they're gearing up. They want a bigger, taller garage. Um, so maybe, you know, and I don't know whether the town is headed in the direction of, of granting, you know, the in-law housing or this type of thing but it seems like that's come up a lot we've had a, a number of people especially in, in non not in the rlg per se but that want to set up an office away from their their home and they would like all the amenities in there and it's been more than more than a couple so dave you're all talking about things but you're but you're talking accessory accessory yeah accessory building accessory building. structure with heat, plumbing, electric, right. everything yep. in it. Preparing, you know, some yeah. of them are saying, well, we're not gonna insulate it yet, but we're gonna yeah. have everything there. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. insulated yeah. while the building yeah. is here. Well, I think that's uh, one of the whole new trend, right? I mean, having a secondary structure on a single lot mm -hmm. is becoming more mm -hmm. frequent because people are living together more, you know, like families are staying together longer. Mm -hmm. Uh, parents are staying with their children longer, et cetera, et cetera. So there are some instances where people want to have a secondary structure. We're going back to the more extended families, mm -hmm. not in the same home, but on the same parcel. On the same parcel. We're going back 150 years. Mm -hmm. But that's probably that's probably controlled by the hard line on the height request, right? And planning, we don't see yeah. We don't see variances come across for height. Right. Because right. right. people sure. pretty much know. No. Some. Some. Not some. But, but I think that's one that's been communicated by the boards that the community, there's not an architect alive that'll, at least that, that knows the community that'll drop a height variance. Mm -hmm. uh, that's true. I mean, all, all the architects who work on Canada Will Lake right now recognize that it's restricted to a 20 foot height, mm -hmm. and a 25 foot height. and Everybody knows it, so they don't even bother going and asking for a variance. So why isn't it like that about all? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we're granting variances. That's why people, when you grant when you grant variances, again, it's not a bad thing. It's heavily regulated. I mean, it's not something you, you're just pulling out of your wallet and doing. But um, it, if there if there's clarity, for example, hey, we know the town's okay with bigger homes. Or with more permeable stick, more uh, non-permeable spots, then why not? Why not push it? Um, and maybe the reason the town is the variances are rolling through is because the town board and the planning board haven't taken a, a strong position, right? The okay. goal isn't always to close the door on all variances. That's why we have a zoning board. The goal is to to make sure that the zoning board understands what the town board is after, and that the planning board understands. What the town board. But it communicates quickly. Yeah, exactly. Six months of the issuing variances opens the floodgate. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and I think from a planning board perspective, that's the hard part for us. I would, if, if the community is evolving and we're looking for higher surface coverage, for example, in many ways, I could see how planning could allow for a height variance more than a surface variance. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're trying to plan for access. We're trying to plan for flood control. 
Um, because the I brought this up last week, the, the whole question of the aesthetics and look and feel of a neighborhood. What the heck does that even mean? Uh, how, do, how do I determine that from planning? Uh, it looks like it's in character with the neighborhood. Right? So I, I would, my, my perception would be if it fits within the space, if there's not reasons to go high because we can see it from the lake or because some other disturbance, then I would rather have that variance than paving the entire thing so that water kept it's, it's, it's the, it's the uh, Supreme Court definition, right? I, I know it when I see it, right? I couldn't explain it, but I know it when I see it. And, you know, I, there are probably folks around this table who would say, I can, I can define candidate with neighborhood character for you readily right now. Um, and we might get five or six different answers, right, about what that looks like. Um, that's why we have so many people around this table, because we need those filters. So the goal was to kind of stack up what's what's gnawing at you, or at least you know, what's keeping you busy anyway, right? Um, and then to have a bit of a discussion about where we want to go with it, right? G.I. Joe used to say, knowing is half the battle. My dad would say, who cares about half the battle? We got to finish the dang battle. So what's the, uh, no G.I. Joe fans in here? <laughs> Great American hero. <laughs> um, so, you know, of these <clears throat> issues up here, um, you know, the town board is interested in folks' take on where you want to go with some of these things. Um, so that the ordinance committee and others can start to take hard looks at, at <clears throat> what's what. And so if, so you know, starting with lot coverage and, and particularly it's tied to um, permeable, permeable area and, and flood issues. Well, before you go there, can sure. I, um, sorry. No, um, I think there's, my opinion, there should be one more thing on your list. Yeah. And it, it comes back to how you phrased the question. Um, as a zoning board, we haven't seen a lot of these yet, but the new um, code-based or based, based or based or based code. We have seen we are starting to see requests for variances in that. And um so we can't I can't say we've seen a lot of we've seen two, but they're yeah. well, I got two others if you want to keep adding to them. Yeah, no, we want to stack them up. Other than the alleged that's what we're doing. But I can add a couple. Right. Um, I think there's an ordinance now that doesn't allow uh, pools on Lakeside allows. <clears throat> and that has come up recently. The other one that has come up often, but I think that again, architects are afraid to ask the question now because what's been so stringently adhered to is um, 100 foot accessory structure on the lakeside, regardless of lot size. Yeah, so the Give me the nature of that. What's the so if you want to put a boathouse or a storage structure on the lake side of the road. And you already have, and it's going to be an accessory structure, not a main residence. It can only be 100 square feet or less. In the RLD. In the RLD. And yeah. it doesn't matter if it's on the lake side or not. In the RLD, you can have one detached garage up to 900 square feet. Well, all the rules. Um, and one additional accessory structure, 100 square feet, if you're zoned RLD. And maybe another and one is so. Uh, Permeable, uh, permeable, permeable pavers as an as an accessory structure. Yeah. Um, as a structure, yeah. period. Yeah. Permeable pavers. I mean, it's considered from a, a you know they're asking for a, a variance to put permeable pavers down. Uh, for any of it. Yeah, it's, as an accessory structure. That's that's the way the town treats it. The town code defines an accessory structure and gives examples, and the patio is one of them. Wow, patio as an accessory. Structure. Yep. Interesting. So I think and this I think it was referred to, but not really spelled out. There's a uh, 25 foot height restriction on the RLD. I think this might have been what you were referring to, and uh, it's just 20 feet or 25, 25, 25 feet. You know, height restriction. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work for a lot of reasons. No loads on roof, not aesthetically pleasing. It's just I, I think that is adequate. That's RLD also limited to RLD. Yes. Yeah. 
And I think, think some of these, like to what, what Dave was, by the look on your faces, you're saying that a, a pet, you know, is an accessory structure. These are the type of things that we need to yeah, look exactly. at in here and say if the zoning board has a hard time wrapping its head around, you mean a patio? A patio is an counts as your accessory structure. You can have a shed or you can have a patio. Yes. And then that those things, this is why I'm glad we're doing this. So then those conversations are like, maybe we need to look at that and mm -hmm. really decide where our focus is. Sidewalks that's, are that's about the a structure thing. also. Yeah. That's Sidewalks are a structure. Yeah. Yeah. And that's if you want to go works. further, if someone puts in a gravel driveway, <laughs> I was going to say it's lot over. It's a lead for that. <laughs> Yeah, it's because it doesn't allow riparian drainage on the lake. That's why all those things take away the lake's ability to heal itself. Matt, one other thing I know the staff and ECB and the planning board, uh, we are continually wrestling with natural resource inventory and trying to get applicants aware and sensitive to. You know how valuable those resources are, yeah. and I I know we 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 make every, every meeting, every application, we make sure that uh, they have been defined, they've been shown on the plan, and uh, uh, I think as we do that, we'll get more compliance with saving our streams, our steep slopes, and yeah, lots. Great point. <clears throat> steep slopes is another one. Steep slopes that showed up in the survey. Yeah. Yep. I didn't hear Tim what you said. Steep slopes. That's another one that gets variances. So, which of these things are not in the residential flood district? Because I think it seems like almost yeah. all of the problems are in the RLG. That seems like low hanging fruit, right? It's our, it's our blessing and our curse. Right. It really yeah. is. Right. Probably your minimum house size. Minimum house size is not. Yeah. Yeah. That's not a problem. The, well, no. the other no. <laughs> no. the other variants that you see outside the RLD are like uh, accessory structure in the yard or side yard. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's an appropriate, that's a good thing to grant the variance on because the zoning board, mm -hmm. you can't legislate for all situations. Mm -hmm. The zoning board gets to take a nice hard look at it Where and say, yep, this is 40 acres. The house is halfway back through the lot, the drive, you know, and it's blocked by trees. Sure, let's give them a variance. I don't see a fix for that. And that, that may be new, but I think that's why I have the zoning board. Yeah, right. right. So it was quirky. Uh, but, but for the most part, I'd say other than those, your variances are are all we really right? But There's for now, but I want to come back to what you said about form based code because we're going to be seeing quite a few of those in the next little bit. Yeah, as we're working as we're working through our form based code and you know, it's new and kind of dealing with the actual implementation of it because we've had one building that's still been under construction for a few years in form based code and now, you know, we're we're going to be implementing that. So again, it's it's up this what's why it's beneficial. You know, it's like, okay, we have discussions with people who want to come in and, and do some projects and some development and build houses. You know, we need to know, it's like, yeah, you're in the form-based code, but you can probably get away with, you know, X, Y, and Z, or here's some things that you can do rather than just saying no form-based codes, form-based code. Mm -hmm. So that's, that is going to be the next, another big thing, not in the RL. That's why I brought it up. Yeah, it's, it's, in it's, here. it's great. Uh, Jared, did the form-based code was... After this comprehensive plan, by a yeah, by six times. Uh, <laughs> it, was it, was it was within uh, end of, yeah, beginning to end. It was in that 21 20, it was before yeah. 2022. I know that, yeah, yeah. it was, yes. yeah. We started working on the board based program like 2018. We started, it was, it was started yeah. pre. Pre-2020, uh, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. <laughs> and then it was definitely finished by 22. So I think it's, and this is updated from 21. So pretty much same time. Well, it makes it very difficult to be character of the neighborhood mm -hmm. when you've got the next door neighbor that they would like to build the same thing and they can't because of form-based code. Mm -hmm. And that's where we are. And mm -hmm. 
And that's the challenge of it. Right. And to, to, you know, we try to follow what the town has come up with, but from, you know, a practical side of it, it's like, yeah. You're saying neighbors that were further out from the formation? No, that are right or? next, you know, there's a number of places along that area, you know, in, in that part of 332 that they've already set up. They've been in business for years, and, oh, yeah. and now somebody wants to build a similar expansion in that mm -hmm. almost duplicate you know, style, and they, they can't, but they can't. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, one, I, I started the, the session by talking about how these codes <laughs> stale and stale quickly, but also when we're, when we're designing them, we're trying not to do it in isolation. We're trying to anticipate things like that, but it doesn't always happen. It doesn't always work. And so we work in fast growing communities that do a, pa a pretty decent package of zoning updates every quarter, right? They, they come together and say, all right, you know, we just did this form base, particularly in a, something as complex as form based code and good or bad, whatever you think of it, radically different than what you were doing before, right? Much different than what was sitting there before. So the zoning board is gonna to have to take some time with it, the planning board, the town board, and you're gonna to have to see what evolves from it. And issues like the one you're talking about are gonna crop up, and what are we gonna do, right? And so it's gonna be important for the ordinance committee and the town board and the planning board um, to keep your finger on the pulse as development happens up there. One day that building might get finished. <laughs> Can I just take advantage of your statement there and give the flip side of that? Yeah. As we're legislating, as the coordinates committee is considering things, town staff is drafting them, town board is adopting them, and all the rest of the board are commenting. Uh, what I've been talking to staff about, I think it's something you all just be on board with. Um, you can't legislate for every eventuality. The flip side of what Matt says is gotta fix the mistakes. Oh, geez, we didn't even think of that. Or, oh, this new thing pops up. You can't get the code perfect, so you might as well get it in place mm -hmm. and then plan on doing a package of zoning, you know, having a public hearing at every town board meeting and you know, presenting new codes, little bitty codes to tweak a little bit. Um just needed to plug that. No, so that's a great, great plan point. on doing that is my recommendation. Yeah. If we did, I mean, if we if we did that a lot, we'd wear ourselves out when, you know, if we did it for the whole code book, but a code book would be a lot cleaner you know, mm -hmm. if we did that more often. Well, I said that form based code is going to need some attention because you <coughs> can't some people come in wanting to build the structure of that. <laughs> Because of the amount of transparency, amount of glass that has to be in that structure, building an apartment building and trying to get it to stay up, you know, without using steel, <laughs> it's so expensive. You can't build it using wood. You can't get that transparency, that uh, seventy-five percent or whatever the number is. You know, it, I mean, it, it, the whole effort was mixed use to, to get. Things that look similar to one another, but we don't care what the usage within bounds. Yeah. Of course. But there are practical things there that you know we we enacted that, but at the time we enacted it, of course there was nothing built. Yeah. This was all dealing with the future, but now that we're getting to the future, now we've got to go back and look at some, it. Uh, time out, you know? And that apartment building's not going through. <laughs> <laughs> There's yeah, a I mean, yeah, there's a question about, yeah. so you're always going to have this, this wrestling match, right, between regulation and the market, right? So you'll know in two years, or two years from the, we're already beyond two years, so now we know, did we have our thumb too heavy on the scale? Um, we, were, we were shooting for a look, right? That's what form-based code does. We were shooting for a look. Can we still get the look? And the economic growth that we're looking for. What, what, what happened there and what was keeping them from it? And the people in this room are critical to talk to. Applicants are critical to talk to. Builders who used to build in Canandaigua and don't anymore. Uh, it's, it'd be good to know what's going on with those folks, architects. Um, these are all these are all okay. future meetings you should be having, future work sessions. Why aren't you building in the in the form-based code district? And they'll tell you. You've got no problem telling them why they're not doing. I think new development would love to go into form based code of the existing buildings that want to change. change up that can't 
with the new new uh, standard, um, the zoning board has had two requests, and in the middle, it asks for some guidance. Sarah was able to get uh, Bergman to come in and give a little session mm -hmm. for the zoning board. And uh, you want to? Well, we need right that? we need feedback on that stuff too. So then we can turn around and say, hey, maybe we need to tweak it. Maybe it's, it shouldn't be X percentage of a building gets touched, then the whole thing has to meet form based code. Mm -hmm. Or maybe we should have that change that in the that feedback's important. It'd be interesting to know too, Chris, if you're seeing transition periods for codes like this, right? That's where the other thing. Yeah. Right. Where we're gonna in year one, you know, mm -hmm. keep an eye on it and and see what we can do, give some guidance <laughs> the to the zoning, the planning and zoning boards. Um, it works perfect for some application. Yeah, I mean, some property owners, developers are just over the moon about it, and some just can't do it. <laughs> don't can't do what they think they want to do or think they can't do. Well, it's kind of discouraging because when we created the form based code, it was meant to be kind of like a ding ding ding, all are welcome kind of sign built here. And that's not what we've seen happen. So, yeah. so but that was the whole point of it was, okay, please stop destroying the steep slopes and everything else. Yeah, like, here's a great here. spot. It's got everything you need. We'll, we'll, we'll let you build whatever you want. Yeah. Pretty much. And that's not what's happened. I mean, obviously we've had a massive global pandemic in that period too, but still. The only exist, I believe the only existing form-based code building mm -hmm. is the one that wasn't that the form based code hasn't been passed yeah, yet. Yeah. That isn't that isn't built yet. Yeah. Uh -huh. hasn't been that, that's the town of Kino Bay in the first page. No, it's our oh, it's, it's, it's the ice box it's there. It's our it's first gauge. It's, it's our first gauge. It's 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 our first so, off your point, Chris, more like an aquarium. Yes. The <laughs> current housing development that is being contemplated here in Canada, what? They had issues already with the form can't, can't form use the form based code. Right, right. right. They're asking for variances from the form based code already. Mm -hmm. And it's our first housing experience. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's why we're moving by that sin and sin zoning application. Yeah. Because it's have, in order to facilitate that. Right. What's the stall point? What's the issue? Uh, transparency, transparency, uh, well, facade. Well, well, like, they want single family residential, which you yeah. can't do. Yeah. 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 That, and that's not even the yes, yeah. That was right. that was part of the base code. That was part of our zone. I think Sarah wants to speak. If we're talking about uptown landing, it is not transparency that's causing them to go to the Senate zoning as much as it is they want smaller lots. Right. Yeah, right. They were going to have to ask for how many single family homes they're proposing? Like 30, 300, 300 something, 300. Well, so they wanted smaller the lot homes, yeah. sizes, and they were going to have to ask for like 200 or whatever variances yeah. against that. I think that was the, the biggest trigger. That you know, okay, you're really insisting on that. You don't, you really don't want to conform. Then yeah, maybe instead of zoning is the path. I think they're still trying to keep the the spirit that, uh, of the form based code. <laughs> that's not even the yeah. form of form based code. It's lot size, which is in the throwback. You could even go in your over. Yeah. Feet and inches, but in but in discussions with well, them, the concerns were it was the transparency for a home and, and to Chris's point structure of form based code. Yeah, that's and, my response and um, the facade, you know, the amount of brick coverage versus vinyl and the cost that that would incur, I think things like that mm -hmm. were some of the that's other related questions. to the form based yes. code. But what Sarah's saying is true that that <laughs> is concerns about. Zoning in the size of lots. Yeah. So you were getting, we were getting a, a, at this in a couple of different places earlier. But mm -hmm. when I talk about can't holding Canandaigua out as kind of a planning mecca uh, or a well-planned community, we're just talking about your map room. Uh, and when <laughs> I go to the planning federation or other places, and like, you know, how many, Sarah or Jim, how many square miles? Sixty-two. Sixty-two square miles. <laughs> and there's so much acreage. More flat ground than anywhere. You can build as many houses as you want, but the town decided that's not for us, right? We're going to preserve farmland. 
We're going to preserve active agriculture. We're going to preserve view sheds at the lake. We're going to preserve steep slopes. We're going to preserve water quality. Bang, 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 bang. But by the time you do that, it starts to zero in on this little spot appropriately. We're going to try to build where we've got an existing infrastructure, right? So we don't mm -hmm. burn ourselves out on infrastructure. By the time you do that, you zone yourself into this little spot. But if you do that, then single family gets tougher to do at any lot size because you're basically limiting the number of the amount of development you're going to have um, and town wide. And if you're going to, if you're going to allow too much single family housing in there, then you're doing a trade-off, right? We're going to have less commercial, less dense development, those kinds of things, which again, you're right smack dab next to the city. So maybe that's okay. Well, the same development does have townhome and apartment, which actually didn't really have, I don't think that many variances for, for the transparency. Mm -hmm. They sort of met what the form base code was asking for in those yeah. sections. But. So I only say that to when you're going through your analysis, mm -hmm. when you're going back through your review, reminding yourself how you got here, right? How, what, what, what policy goal were you trying to achieve through a form based code? And then asking ourselves, is there a different way to get at that and get this other stuff that we want to do? So it sounds to me, and I don't want to try to steer this conversation, um, but it sounds to me like the two big chunky things that that we need to be looking at are implementation of the form-based code. How's that coming along? When we talk about great zoning codes, we talk about clear and productive, right? Clear means the average Joe can read it and know what you're trying to get at, right? Know what you were trying to do. Productive means it spit out what we wanted it to spit out at the end. And I always talk about the Matthorn double take where I'm driving down the road and like, Whoa, what happened there? Um, you know, the planning board approved it and it didn't come out the way the planning board moved it would. Uh, that's a, that's a, <laughs> when we, or turn out at all. Right? And a lot of times when we do zoning work, we have, we have uh, an architecture group in our team and we have two different architects look at the same piece of code. And we tell one, build us the best looking project you can build. Mm -hmm. And we tell the other, build us the absolute cheapest project. You can build. <laughs> and that's where you find the holes, right? So anyway, form-based code is still a TBD because we're not seeing the development activity that we had hoped. The applicants that are coming are asking for something different than what the code is affording today. And so there's a policy question to be had there. Where does the town want to go with that piece of ground up there? And there's a, uh, a an implementation piece there or, or a mechanical piece there. What's the code say today? And is that going to work for us? And then in the RLD, there's lots of issues, right? There's lots of questions. And it sounds even today like a little bit of push and pull, um, a little bit of push, push and pull, right? We're worried about flow. We're worried about uh, water quality. We're worried about the... I whoops, first first uh, use of the word riparian in a while. We're worried about that, the health of the riparian buffer, right? Um, and at the same time, you can, you can completely understand how a constituent might come to you and say, permeable pavers at a, <laughs> are considered a structure? Uh, permeable paver constructed patio is considered a structure? Question mark. The policy was we want to protect the, the lake from runoff. Permeable pavers achieve that. So what's going on? Sarah, I would, Sarah wouldn't let me get away with that whole thing. Uh, it, don't achieve, it doesn't achieve it perfectly, but it, it goes, it takes steps to achieve it. Better than that. Better than that. Right. A gravel driveway, which is as rustic and rural and, and pleasant as you can imagine. Here are the, the rocks bouncing off my bikes, folks, right? But it's, imper it's, it's impervious. Right, um, water's going to run off of it, and nutrients are going to get carried down to the lake. That's what happens. And so, today in this room, I don't hear unanimous consent to go one way or the other. Right, so that's a policy discussion that's got to happen at the board level, and that gets informed by folks like the planning board and the EC. So, what I'm hoping to be able to provide to the to the town board is a good <clears throat> summary of these issues and the questions that need to be resolved, right? And then you can hand that to the planning board and the zoning board and the ECB and say, tell us what you're thinking. 
Um, and then that funnels around through the staff and the ordinance committee before it makes its way up to the town board, right? Um, so I want to, I'm going to read this to you. So, cause I promise you, you wouldn't have to read it, but like the big picture issues that come across in the RLD are things like lot coverage, the per permeable area, larger homes, which is the same thing, right? It's the same issue. We, we don't care how big people's houses are, except that it's creating more runoff, right? Uh, setbacks, I, I want that in here, except that's particularly for generators and, and away from streams and seat slips. I, I put that in here as an RLD issue. Is it just an RLD issue? We're not seeing that in many other places. No, the generators aren't an RLD. Not generators are everywhere. Are everywhere. They're everywhere. <laughs> the generator setbacks aren't. Where the biggest problems where you have like the, the town homes that yeah. are right next to yeah. each other. Yeah. Yeah. There's the same no James. place for them we had to for defense. Is it an issue? We see them. We, we see them. We see those requests, but the request if it's an issue where people can't have a generator up at all. Well, they don't want to put it in the back. Choices have consequences. <laughs> by the middle townhouse unit. Yeah, I mean it, it is. I mean that's yeah. that's the feedback I've gotten from it. Is that I can't put a generator now I can't have a second. You know, I have this, you know, this oxygen or dialysis or whatever it might be health issue, and I can't have a generator because I can't get the setbacks for it. Right. Also known as a self-created hardship, right? And that's mm -hmm. that's kind of how you look at it. Right. So so all right, that's a broader issue. The minimum home size, which we don't see uh, anywhere beyond the RLD, or is that an all over town conversation? That's all over town. That would be all, all over town. town. I don't think we see it say, in the RLD. I don't, I don't, don't think it's in the RLD. Not a lot of uh, 500, 500 square foot <laughs> many mansions. Huge <laughs> lake, a house, or a huge lake lot, and just put an outhouse on it, a little micro. <laughs> minimum housing, correct me if I'm wrong. Chris, so you put your name tag down. That's kind of aggressive. <laughs> it's an affordable housing. That yes. Is right? yes. Yes. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So, Thank you. I've got a policy up here around affordability. Rezoning from other types of zoning districts to residential or to less dense residential. Is that fair? Yeah, I, I would love the board's inputs on that because we've had a couple times where people have said, can we rezone this residential? And you know, I, I heard different things when I was on the Economic Development Committee pre-2020 that was, we need more industrial, we need more commercial, and now I think post-2020, that may not be the answer. So I, I would love to have other people's input on if we need to preserve our remaining commercial industrial zones or if we should allow people to have residential projects. That has to come up specifically mm -hmm. in the 332 corridor where Airport, right? we have yeah. large lot, large parcels that could be used for home for more dense housing. But again, it's any discussion on that, it's well, that's sacred industrial, mm -hmm. but it's been sacred industrial for a long time. <laughs> yeah. it's and vacant. it's and it's it still vacant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or it doesn't fit yeah. what in what industry wants. So that's another piece of feedback, I think, is the benefit. Well, we great that discussion. Yeah. Here. And I was gonna say we've worked around that issue mm -hmm. a lot. There's there's a lot of really cool industrial areas with everything you'd ever want for an industrial area, big lots of sewer and lots of water and airports and highways and throughways. Nobody built on it yet, right? For some and a, a virtually dollar or less per thousand of property tax and, no, and nobody's still building that. And our G and E can't promise you. Oh, that's the other thing. It's the other thing. Yeah. Yeah. You can't even build a row of townhouses with our G and E. <laughs> so that's a good question. that's a good question too. I mean a fun exercise for the boards to go through would be to grab in the comp plan, there's a future land use map. Grab that future land use map and validate it. Make sure that it's still what you're thinking because that should answer your question. Yeah. We shouldn't be rezoning a foul or a fly from that. So if we need to correct that, let's correct that first. Um, and so the planning board and the zoning board could each, and the ECB, sorry, could all weigh in on uh, on that future land use map and then that, that'll kick up to the... Um, to the town board. Can you put that down as one of your one of your items to remind us about? Absolutely. Because yeah. I think that's very beneficial. I think and tying tying into that as well, turn to the potential after dealing with German brothers this year, the potential of expanding what could could be developable. Mm -hmm. 
that would go into that zone, that zone and that concept, I think. Mm -hmm. If the community is to allow it. Right. That, that does come up as a, either an activity like that happens where they try to bring something in that doesn't accumulate, or the community talks about not having access to a, and commercial availability around the lake as well. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's a, it's a great tool, and it's something that we can kind of try to live by. We have to, actually. Um, secondary uses, uh, the offices, eight potential ADUs. Um, Townwide. Town -wide, that's a broad issue, <laughs> town-wide. That's really what we are. Sorry, too many acronyms. Oh, it's so old. Mm -hmm. There's no... There's no um, so that's a whole base code issue. Lakeside pools, lake side pools, lake, uh, lake side, uh, accessory structures, how we define what an accessory structure is. Um, can, can I mention that you, you were talking about like overriding questions? And yeah. For me, you, when you get to things like lakeside pools and accessory building units, I think, you know, all of our planning documents, and I think hopefully most people in this room, is it our number one goal? to how can we protect the lake? I mean, I, I think before we ever make any decision anywhere in this town for the preservation of economic development, our community, our future, everything, our history, our number one question on anything should be, is this a positive for the lake or a negative for the health of the lake? And if it's a negative for the health of the lake, we should be saying no, period. <laughs> and that's, I mean, we, the lake's at such a tipping point right now, and it's such a driver for our entire community. But that, I think we've reached the point in our community where, where we have to say, no, yes, we would like a lot of things. It would make everybody's life easier. But if it's a negative impact on the lake, it's just got to trump everything else, in my opinion. You're allowed to have a yeah, you're a chain warrant because you <laughs> wouldn't use permeable paints. No. <laughs> no, no, no. I think you would get the block. And then you take that in and we're like, hey guys, guess what? No, no, I no. put permeable papers. No, I'm talking about lakeside pools. Yeah. Your first, your first pool was a lakeside pool. No, it's not a prototype pool. Oh. Sarah, what's the rule of lakeside pools? I don't actually remember. You can have like six. You can have like six. Like, 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 you know, like, all right. I'm not challenging. When I was on the GBA, right, then I'm not we were not a lot of the things. We'll verify it. Yeah. It has to touch the, like, between the house and the lake, you can't put an in ground That's right. or something like that. But, That's right. But That's if you have a house in an RLG, you can put a pool in. That's correct. Oh, maybe that's, that's okay. correct. It's just placement of the pool. Can't be between the house and the lake, right? Yeah. On the lake side. Yeah. Right. So that's the lake. That, that's how I read lakeside pool. So, but that's good clarification. Yeah. yeah sorry. That's something. Yeah. Um, so that's, I mean, you're, what you're getting at is, and what, what I think that boards can help inform and, and, uh, so that yeah. the town board has to think about are, we call them planning principles or governing principles. What? How are we going to filter these projects? When these projects show up, or and not just projects, but policy shifts. How are we going to filter a policy shift? We're going to ask questions like: Does it contribute to or diminish the health of the lake? Does it contribute to or diminish the cost of uh, of government on residents on existing residents? Right. Um, because a lot of development, we we run in and say every all development is revenue, but we're not interested in revenue. We're interested in net revenue, right? Net revenue, and so um, so that's a good a good conversation for the town board to have. Is what are our governing principles? What are our overarching filters that we're going to use to run some of these policy changes through? It'll answer a lot of the questions for you. Uh, the height restriction. Uh, in, in the RLD, 25 foot height restriction. Um, and this wasn't an issue because it's evolving, but reinforcing the natural resources inventory, making sure that applicants recognize what the impacts of their development are and what mitigating factors could be to address that. And consider that in their design of upfront. Absolutely. Uh, a lot of times it's, we're the bad guys. You don't have to, yeah, you shouldn't yeah, have to coach them, right? So that's really a staff conversation, right? When it comes in the door, 
for the staff to be, kind of be that filter to say, hey, well, just so you know, you're going to get to the planning board and this is going to be an issue. So map it, show us what the impacts are, show us what your mitigating factors are before it gets the best planning board. Understood. S development on steep slopes, is that, that's an RLD issue, obviously. That's town wide. Mm -hmm. That's town wide. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Um, the form based code, why isn't so that goes to the RLD issues? Um, and we touched on some town wide issues. Well, hold on. Um, the form based code, why isn't why isn't it developing the way we anticipated it? Right? And what of those millions of different reasons are within our control? What can we do about that? Right? So most certainly, you know, globally, there's been shifts in development since you adopted the forms. But regionally, we seem to be weathering that pretty well. Um, there's the, there's certainly <laughs> development in, in lots of communities. Um, so these are all questions, not statements, but is it the transparency that's bugging them down? Is it the cost to develop what we want developed that's bugging them down? Yeah, Sarah. I think one of the things to keep in mind when we think about this is in our form based code region, we don't have a huge number of vacant lots. We do ah, have some yeah. vacant acreage, but a lot of that is involved in the incentive zoning request with the housing project we were talking about. Mm -hmm. A lot of the other lots that are in the form based code zoning district already have something on it. And what do they have on it? Arbular yeah, and yeah. other, you know, commercial based and that, kind of stuff. Yeah. that are set well back from the road. And that's one of the key features of the form based code is close to the road. So, a lot of the applications that and we don't have a ton of applications, but a lot of the ones we are seeing is for someone who wants to expand an existing building immediately. They're going to need a variance to do that if they don't want to push it out front towards the road. Right? The variance yep. that it's the funny. zoning board has been told the, yeah. the way to achieve the form based code is not to grant variances. So we're okay. trying to get developers to think about just think differently about it. You know, they come in and want to expand, and like, remember, you go forward. You don't have to go side to me. You've got space to go towards the road now. Um, and so I think, you know, redeveloping a lot or changing a building in the form based code just looks a lot different than developing a vacant parcel in the form based code. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that don't forget there's two very different form based code areas. Yeah, we have two like districts. districts. Yeah. So, Matt, in your experience, how long does it take for a code, like when there's a significant code change like that? The, it's probably it's three. Three. It's hard to say because. Markets vary, right? Um, and what 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 I was getting at earlier is what most often happens when we see a sluggish development is you got ahead of the market, right? Your regulations were heavier handed than the market will allow. So then the market backs off, watches to see what happens. Nothing happens, and we just sit there vacant for a while. But you know, we've participated. The first four base code I ever did was twenty years ago in coastal South Carolina. It, it was like you lit a, a stick of dynamite. Things just moved because the market was ready um, and, it, and it hustled. That's not the only reason. You could have kinks in your form-based code that are just trapping people. That's what we're trying to get at here. Um, if the market's right for the level of regulation you have, it's going to develop. The end. I mean, that's what's going to happen. And so that's just the nature of, of economics. But um, but I I'd want to I'd talk to some developers out there. And you all do, so we, we probably already have the answers, but I want to talk to some developers out there and say, we, you looked interested in it six months ago or a year ago. What did you find in the development process that stopped you, that gave you pause? I, yeah, we've had a couple of developers come in with form-based code, just sketch plans. Plan. Mm -hmm. I mean, one with like the world's greatest form-based code proposals, all the Brownstone style with mm -hmm. views, mm -hmm. it's amazing. Boston. Garages in the back. Yeah, yeah the Boston. Yeah, yeah. But again, it's kind of disappeared. And I think he didn't have the maybe the funds, the funding and the right. experience to yeah, really yeah. do it. But I think mean, that that was, if it was like Matt saying, mm -hmm. you know, somebody should have 
gobbled that right up. Yeah, but I think development today is different than it was in 2020. And I think the reality of the marketplace is that the developers haven't figured it out yet. And we're not sure where we're going. Before, bigger was better. Now, everybody's working from home. A lot of people, I shouldn't say everybody, but a lot of people are working from home. And the marketplace really hasn't caught up yet. And to add injury to insult, with the interest rates covering around 8%, 75 8% for commercial money, people can't afford to develop right now. And that's part of the challenge we have with Uptown, is that there's no push to hurry up and get it going because the interest rates are so high, everybody is sitting back waiting to see what's going to happen. Yeah. I think if we're if we were at two and a half, uptown could be moving a lot faster. Yeah. Well, it's, it's but also yeah, with the novelty stuff. Yeah, but also yeah. The, with the fact that you know Sarah alluded to this before. The reason uptown is kind of where it is, <laughs> is we have there's one, you know, there's one owner, one massive parcel, and it's gonna be a big lift. It's a big lift to do all of that. You don't have multiple people getting involved and five different developers doing their own small little projects. You have one very large project that is in the works, mm -hmm. so that's that's it's the thing. Be it's either it. going to all go, or it's going to it's going to none of it go. Okay. So that's why it's been like that for so long. But I think the other part too, in the in the car dealership area, also, I mean that again, that's the hard part. Is you know talking, you're you're changing your business model. If you expand, you're changing your business model. To fit, which makes it very challenging for the car dealers that I've spoken with and those that have wanted to do things that form based code make it impractical. Uh, a friend of ours who can talk to you about EV charging stations, so the Cal's company. <laughs> I didn't want to say his name, that's why I was talking to you too. So, name may not be spoken. Uh, you know, we, we, we have to ask that question like, how does this impact your business? Are we, are we going to be dealing in, I mean, certainly for the last four years, the car dealers have been dealing in limited inventory. But they don't even know yet. They don't because, know. Exactly. Everything's changing. We got yeah. EVs, you know, everybody was so gung ho with EVs three or four years ago, and now there's not a secondary market for EVs. So they're sitting there scratching their heads saying, what are we gonna do with all these cars? Yeah. And nobody's buying the EVs besides. So it's all gotta be government subsidized or get to make economic sense for people who don't buy these things to begin with. Is there a way, Chris, to create, and maybe this is just the PUD, maybe that's all it is, to have this floating overlay that says, these are the things we're trying to achieve with the form-based code. Um, because what, what you would hate to see, right, is that you ease your foot off the gas um, and people muck it up with a bunch of single story, 5,000 foot setback uses. Yeah. And now we're mm -hmm. now we're even more years away from implementing our vision. Could you drop a could you today, as the law exists, drop a PUD on that thing that the town board liked and the planning board liked? Actually, I one of the things I was going to talk to Jared about after this is why we're doing said but not PD. Yeah. Although I think I know the reasons. Yes, is the answer I think. But I think the town doesn't get the amenities that right. I would really like. Right. Um, but right. there may be some, I think you know, this has just been very helpful for a lot of reasons, but you've sort of focused everybody in the room on the form based code that. You may be able to get the policy goal that you wanted, drive the development there without making the car dealership say, geez, I can't even add a bay on my garage yeah, exactly. or whatever. Yeah. And fight about it. Because I think 20 years from now, all the garages are going to be in front of the parking is going to be back in car dealerships. But are we the ones to lead the way or not? And that's right. a policy decision. Yeah. So I have a question. Sarah, at what how much can you change before they actually start to change services? Because there was a certain level yeah, of- Yeah, the threshold, like usually 50%. Yeah. Something like that was my 10 minutes. So, I mean, yeah. I mean yeah. that, that could be too low. Well, that wasn't know. my answer to that. That was <laughs> my 10 <laughs> minutes to math. <laughs> yeah. Look, that might be a little bit- Right, and I, I was going to ask Chris that same question. Like, we have discretion over that. Could the town board pass a law that says, 
it's not 50%, it's 75%, whatever the we number is. We would just tweak, to the we, just tweak to, we need to go back and look at the form based code and tweak, maybe make some tweaks to it like, to realize, oh, these things are were good ideas, but they're they're too heavy handed. So we need to pull it back a little bit. It's the same thing I wanted to share. Specific something that another thing that we could change feedback I've gotten is people are, you know, people have asked about, well, I want to do something. Uh, one of them was at the old where the Georgian motel is, you know, take that whole thing out, but they wanted to start in the back of the parcel and they work their way up to the front. Mm -hmm. And the feedback was you've got to start in the front, the front and, and you got to work back. back. Mm -hmm. So here we had somebody who wanted to take down something and bring new a revenue generating you know, revenue generating growth to an area where it fits, it backs right up to, you know, warehouses and it's an old, and it's an old unused motel, but because they wanted to start in the back of the parcel and expand and finish in the front. Yeah. That's why the PUD makes fit. sense, right? It's yeah. phased, the town board approves the site plan, the planning board approves the site plan. Maybe they never build it, but at least they can't jam it up with something crummy. I think that was what Mr. Cook's goal or initial I mean five before I think that was his initial thought was PUD. Mm -hmm. um, maybe that. So I just got the I just got the <clears throat> signal the bat signal through uh, a few minutes but we're gonna we're, I think that's clear right we're gonna have to unpack the form based code and scratch at it. And then the last thing that I would suggest relative to your question particularly about rezoning requests is I would suggest that each of the boards uh, sit down ahead of the town board, sequence it so that the town board gets your recommendations. Um, let's say, all right, here's the existing future land use map. Here are some things that don't make sense to us anymore. It's been a couple of years. We know now more about the market than we did three years ago, four years ago. Um, so town board, we want you to consider these changes. So back to mechanics, you're not really supposed to be rezoning unless it aligns with the form or with the future land use map. And so let's just be careful that we're doing that the right way. Um, now, I don't remember, I think that this was generated in-house, the comp plan was generated in-house and typically a good lawyer will tell you, make sure that future land use map is as no, no, I flexible as possible. And for Eric and, and Doug had, had it and the committee was great and uh, there's no reason to spend my money, uh, you know, yeah. kind of money on me to give them a separate thing. But I can almost guarantee, and you're absolutely right, you got to zone and um, uh, coincide with the, your conflict. I can guarantee you it says we want to drive our development right there, at which point we can really, we've got a lot of flexibility. With yeah, exactly. mm -hmm. Flexibility. So, what my next step would be, or will be, is I'm going to generate a couple of page memo about this conversation tonight. And what it's gonna do is provide you with some recommended action items, but they're going to align with what we just talked about. The two big picture things to look at are all the things we talked about with respect to the RLD. You can get sweeping change with the with one big district like that. Uh, analysis and discussion and updates to the form-based code, picking at some of these broader town-based issues that we really gotta get a, a, a handle on, um, and then updating your future land use map to make sure it aligns with what you're still doing. Um, again, a little sequencing. What makes the most sense to me is that the boards review these boards, uh, the planning board, zoning board, ECB, review the document that I send out, um, poke at it, think about it, debate it, talk about it, try to answer some of the questions according to your membership, and then feed that to the town so that the town board, so that they can consider um, your vantage points as they as they move forward. Does that make sense? Here? Mm -hmm. Totally. Anything else for the good of the order tonight? Anything we didn't hit? All right. Thank you all so much for being here. It was a great night. All right. Thank you so much, Matt, yeah. for your input. Thanks, Thanks man. Yeah. And thank yeah. everybody yeah. else. Sure. Uh, another eight years for this. No, I think this. Yeah. Yeah. So feedback. Mm -hmm. Before we before so, we entertain a motion to adjourn, feedback from the boards is this beneficial yes. to get everybody in the same room at yes. least annually um, yes. to have this, sure. and we can yes. talk more with chairs to see if you want to do it more frequently or how you want to do this to align because I think this again 
Um, you know, we don't do this often enough because of the limits that we have. You know, the you know our meetings have to be open, and we need to have the opportunity for the public to listen and for the public who's here. Thank you for taking the time to listen into the meeting tonight. Um, I just did we want to get to the floor want to keep this? this up. I mean, it's it's 26, 27 after. If there is anyone who would like to be, it, so that's so we will we'll work on planning this and trying to make it uh, at least an annual thing to have this kind of refresh and recalibration as we keep roll as we keep rolling forward with things. Um, and for for the planning and zoning and DCB boards, when you have concerns, uh, suggestions, things you're seeing. You know, we sometimes talk about it, but take it to your town board members. Four out of five of them are super approachable and nice. They're all super approachable, and I'm assuming would like to hear from you rather than, you know, you guys telling me your town staff who has limited, you know, can only bring so can only put so much on their plates. Um, but if, you know, if you're on the planning board and you're seeing a problem, one hundred percent, guys, so that they can, quite frankly, force staff and me to address it instead of, you know, mm -hmm. uh, figure out if that's the thing we want to get them to focus on. One hundred percent. It's a suggestion. One hundred percent. All right. So we do have like two minutes left before it's seven thirty. Is there anyone who would like to be heard for privilege of the floor? All right, seeing no hands online and seeing no hands um, in the audience. Still again? Uh, well, I, actually, I was uh, hoping to hear about the protection of agricultural research. Next to an agricultural district. I'd really like to see development away from there. Okay. <laughs> That's the goal. That's the that is, yeah, that is. <laughs> That was part, yeah, that is one of the goals and one of the parts of that's why the form based code discussion was so. I have to look into that. I have yeah. no idea what you're talking about. So, uh, pretty much. Data protection is agricultural yeah. resources is a real. Problem. I heard that in the in the presentation by the facilitator. Yeah. Okay. That was what that was the first thing oh, he said. Oh. Protection of agricultural yeah. resources. Protection of quality of life. Protection yeah. of yeah. the yeah. yeah. Balanced growth. Over the. All right, so I'm this, glad, I'm glad to see yes. a group like this together. Oh, good. Uh, come from the government sector. And, boy, it's going to always talk to your trade. That's why it's important. <laughs> Town of Canandaigua, where all boards are friendly <laughs> and get along, even when we don't. Okay. Right. We all get along. We'll sort to uh, suit each other in this town for well over 15 years. Don't, <laughs> don't, get any, don't get any ideas. Don't get any ideas. All right. With that note, I'm, I'm that. I have to push you to adjourn. I'll just create a business. All in favor? Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Thank you to Sue.